Welcome to Ring of Fire. I'm Mike Papantonio. Coming up on today's show, we'll tell you how income inequality is poisoning our democracy. We'll also be talking about the myth that businessmen make great politicians. And we'll be taking a dark journey into the mind of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. We have all that and more coming up. But right now, remember, you just stepped in to the Ring of Fire. You can't change Washington from the inside. You can only change it from the outside. Grand jury secrecy rules. For political gain. The press can find out. That has nothing to do with politics, but go ahead. It wouldn't bother me. Oops. <laughs> Preventable hospital errors are now the leading cause of death in America, only behind heart disease and cancer. And the problem's getting worse every year. Joining me now to talk about the problem is Dr. Tom Snyder. He's the author of the book, A Physician's Apology. Tom, the reports that are coming out don't speak well at all for the new invented corporate hospital. It used to be that we had doctor-owned hospital. They were independent hospitals. They could function in a way that was morally, uh, socially responsible. Corporate hospitals are killing, literally killing people. The last report that came out says it puts it somewhere around almost 3% fatalities in hospital stays now. And I think that's low, Mike, Yeah. Uh, based on my experiences. It's a frightening environment. You know, we've built a 747 with no wires to the ailerons, the rudders, the stick. There's, there's no communication, no wiring. We've got an aircraft out of control. Well, I, I think I think what's important about the study that came out, came out of uh, ProPublica, yeah, uh, was was very important. First of all, they say that we that you have the American Hospital Association that has been selling the American public on the idea that there's only ninety eight thousand fatalities right. a year, and then yeah. the the newest study that has been verified and said absolutely it's accurate, absolutely it's right on the money. That number is actually four hundred and forty thousand. Let me mm-hmm. say it again: four hundred and forty thousand deaths. Now, what what are the parts of this story that you think are important? Well, one is the fact that at least it's coming out as a truthful f- phenomenon. But the right. numbers, Mike, being in the system as a physician, I can tell you they're skewed because there's such a requirement for physicians, for nurses, for hospital staff to close down on transparency. The public is not to know that. You know, Chevrolet doesn't want you to know that their tires are flat. Uh, and they're not. I'm just saying that. But do you understand what I'm saying? You yes, need to keep yes. this quiet. And that phenomenon is still extraordinarily present. Well, uh, the, what I read about it, Tom, and I, I've read your material on this in the past, it always nails it. And one thing that you talk about is the onset of the corporate hospital. Mm-hmm. The corporate hospital where we have fewer nurses working longer hours. So we're cutting the staff on nurses. Uh, we're making them work harder, and we're paying them less money. You, you're cutting corners on mach- on machines that you probably need, on number of beds that you probably need. Uh, you're cutting corners because the insurance companies are demanding that you cut corners. You have some cat with an MBA that wouldn't know a, wouldn't know what a damn biology book is, much less understand medicine, making decisions about what you can and can't do. And then you have the corporate hospital. The corporate hospital, like the type of thing that that Rick Scott down here in Florida, where he uh, he, he raped the American public for what was one point four billion dollars in fraud. OK, but his hospital, you see, his organizations, they were interested in profit margins. They weren't interested is are we taking care of the doctor, which they didn't do? Are we taking care of the staff, which they didn't do? And most importantly, were we taking care of the patient? You grew up and you have seen this firsthand, and I want to know how accurate that characterization is. Uh, it's underutilized. I mean, it's far worse than that, Mike. I mean, I'm a physician, was in a hospital setting just nine months ago, a local hospital here, with a severe illness, sepsis. I've been given, for example, insulin in the ICU that morning and then was transferred onto the floor that, at, that night and a nurse was going to give me the shot again. Fortunately, my son was with me, and who is a physician, and said, 
If you do that, I'm going to put you through the window. You're going to kill him. You will overdose him with insulin. No, 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 no. And they battled and had to get the chief nurse in before they said, we're really, really sorry, Mr. Schneider, Dr. Schneider. Uh, and, and that really would have killed me. Now, that's me as a physician in a local hospital. Now, why is that? Because we had not a nurse. We had a two steps down giving me my injection who had missed up completely. And what were the head nurses doing? They're reamed with paperwork, legislative paperwork to do, not patient care. Tom, let me tell you a story. I mean, there, there's so many stories that we could oh, go yeah. on just with all these antidotes, but I think this, this nails this story. Patient calls, says, you can't believe what I was just put through at a hospital. She goes in, they're doing a bone marrow test to find out whether cancer has moved into her bone marrow. They give her no sedative at all. Right. Zero sedative, and, and she goes through excruciating pain, virtually passes out from the pain, comes out of there and says, you know, every other time I've done this at other hospitals, they've given me Verset. They've given me something to where the pain wasn't so excruciating I thought it was going to kill me. They tell them there, they tell her there at, the, at, at this operation, well, our hospital doesn't allow us to spend money on that. Yeah, see, what a cover-up. What a complete cover-up. And, and I'm going to kind of cut to the chase and say to you, that all needs to change. There's no question about it. And the emphasis has to be on the structure of the corporate hospital, which is so skewed. But I can't wait for that to happen 10 years down the line with legislation. I want the people listening to your show right now to realize you have to take responsibility for your health care. When you and I were kids, well, I'm a lot older, but <laughs> when I was a kid, doctors were God. If they told you to take two teaspoons of this, you took it and you knew it was right. Today, you better darn well be aware of what that medicine is. I tell my patients, remember this mnemonic, Quest, Quest, Q-U-E-S-T, Q, question everything. Your lab results, if you don't hear about a result, uh, you need to know about it. You understand every procedure, which side of the body it's going to be done on. You know, E, eliminate as many drugs and supplements as you possibly can. You had a great statement a few weeks back ago. You said, Tom, would you agree, don't take medications that haven't been out there for five to 10 years? Absolutely. You, you, you must have a proven track record and know why the medication's being given. S, submitting to tests, CT scans, MRIs, that's the name of the game right now. Recent study. Recent study, 3,000 people undergoing CT scan of the lung, ruling out cancer of the lung. 31%, now that is not a small number, 31% were told you have the probability of a lung cancer. We're going to have to biopsy you. We're going to have to do an MRI. We're going to have to do this. We're going to have to do that. And they're wrong. Those are false positives. 31% were told wrongly, you have the possibility of a cancer. And that's routine. That study's been repeated over and over again. The last thing, T, is please take charge of your health care. Do not count on the system helping you. Bring yeah, your okay. best friend. That, that is great. That's great advice. That's, that's why we always have you on this show. Everybody wants you on their show for that reason. Let me back up. Yeah. And say, say where we are now, we start this analysis by saying 440,000 deaths a year. Now, that's, mm -hmm. that, those are the new statistics. Yep. Nobody seriously questions those new statistics. As a matter of fact, most people say they're understated. Way but low. what's so ugly about this story is the hospital corporations are demanding that the American Hospital Association still go with the numbers of only 98,000 right. deaths a year. And, I mean, to, to put this in perspective, uh, this, is, this is an epidemic. I mean, is there yeah. any other way to describe this other than the health care epidemic? No, and if you're a humanitarian getting to the philosophy, philosophy of this, if there were one death that was needless, careless, or erroneously occurred, if that's me or if that's you, it's horrific. But it doesn't matter if it's you or me. No matter who it is, the goal is to make that a zero tolerance. Zero tolerance. What, doctor, in all, in, in all years, years of experience, where do, you find, where do you find the biggest problem? What, what is the thing that, that, that's the gotcha most of the time for a patient? What is that gotcha moment? I think there has to be, there are multiples, but there have to be a couple on top. One is communication. 
The patients aren't told what's being done or why it's being done. And I mean that not just surgically, Mike. I mean, you need to be on a statin drug to lower your cholesterol. Why, doctor? Why do I have to do that? What good is it going to do for me? What are the complications? Communication, communication, communication. And the biggest error, medications, without a doubt. So aside from just the biggest thing a 40- in, a, in, in, a, in a hospital setting in Absolutely. a hospital setting would that be the situation hospital setting 41 percent the biggest error in medications the wrong medication given and you know just even verbally the drugs sound the same you know I, i'm going to write for diavan really only you've got darvan darvan is a pain medicine diavan isn't any hypertensive but there are zillions of medications that sound alike those one error, eliminate that. It should all be done, printed out. Handwritten, yeah. forget, that's all gone. So yeah. 41% of those in a hospital setting have been given some sort of erroneous medication. Now, doctor, when, you, when I see the, the criticism, I mean, hospital corporation right. really is in charge. The new hospital corporation, I got about 30 seconds. They say that the fewer nurses, the longer hours, the cutting corners, the insurance company demands, the profit margin demands that the CEO is under, that all of those things are combining to, to, to create this very ugly picture that might be irreversible until we reverse the power of the, of the corporate hospital. I couldn't think? agree more. Absolutely. How does it compare with what you grew up with in just a, maybe independent hospitals? Well, the independent hospitals, you know, the emphasis was on the personal relationship of physician to patient. The nurse was there to establish that rapport and to continue the continuity of care afterwards. That's non-existent right now non-existent. A gastroenterologist is going to give you their medications. Your internist is going to give you his medications. The OB is going to give them. There's such a lack yeah. of connectivity, synchronicity that that's what, the, that's what the hospital corporation demands. Absolutely. Right Absolutely. Uh, Tom Snyder, Dr. Tom Snyder, uh, very informative as usual. Thank you for joining me. Love having. Thanks, Mike. The Supreme Court is going to be handing down rulings that are going to affect everything from workers' ability to form unions to preserving environmental protection. And the fate of these important decisions rests in the hands of people like Clarence Thomas. And that is very scary. I have Ian Mielheiser with me from Think Progress to explain exactly how dangerous that is. Ian, I've seen comparisons. Uh, they've kind of left me cold having being a lawyer and having been through constitutional law after constitutional law class and actually teaching constitutional law myself. I, I saw that uh, you had a Yale professor in one of the articles that you wrote that compared Thomas uh, uh, to Clarence Thomas to Hugo Black. And uh, to me, it was almost like comparing Bruce Springsteen to Justin Bieber. Uh, now, I know that what the comparison was was methodology, but I even, mm-hmm. I even have questions about that. But t- talk, about, talk about what's happened uh, with this character, Clarence, uh, Clarence Thomas, and what kind of impact he's having on the court. Sure. I mean, Justice Thomas is in many ways the anti-Justice Black. Um, black came to the court in the 1930s at a time when the justices had just decided they were going to impose their own libertarian economic views on the whole country. So you had cases striking down child labor laws, cases striking down laws protecting unions, cases striking down the minimum wage. And Black was the justice who really more than anyone else tried to say, look, We've got to follow the text of the Constitution. These crazy things that these justices have been writing into the Constitution just aren't there. And he tried to be respectful of the language of the Constitution and both enforcing the rights that are, all, that are actually protected by it while at the same time not making stuff up. Well, what and, I find, Ian, what yeah. I find is that you have a judge that is making stuff up with Clarence Thomas in, in so many ways. What, what I thought was interesting is uh, in your piece where you talk about beware Clarence Thomas is one of America's top legal minds. Uh, you know, I, hopefully, hopefully in jest, I think it was. But here you have a, a situation where article after article has been written. The man hasn't asked a question in, in, in five years. The man hasn't asked a question in six years. The man hasn't asked a question in six 
seven years from the bench. Now, the, the, the conservatives want to say, well, gee, he's just thoughtful. Uh, he's introspective. But I've read his stuff uh, time and time again. I've analyzed the stuff that he is. And all I can conclude, in is that what we have here is a justice who is no, 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 no less than a politician dressed up in a black robe. Now, I don't see that being uh, a Hugo Black. Hugo Black still did rely on some precedent. He still relied on stare decisis. But the but as you point out in your article, the 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 idea that is being sold by the right is that mm-hmm. here's this here's this character who simply uses the same methodology of Black and and almost to to conclude that he was as as brilliant as Hugo Black. And I, I just the 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 two it, it's really an irony to me. I mean, I, I actually, I, I, I was being serious when I said that I think that he's a really smart, a uh, really smart lawyer. I think he's very, very dangerous. Clarence Thomas is because of how smart he is. Mm-hmm. I, I think that his project is to undo all the things that people like Justice Black wanted to do. His project is to undo this notion that justices shouldn't be making our economic policy. He wants to bring us, in many ways, back to the era where child labor laws were considered unconstitutional, to the era where something like the federal ban on whites-only lunch counters would have been unconstitutional. And he has successfully, in his time on the court, taken these ideas that 25 years ago would have been considered a joke and rightfully were considered a joke and pushed them to the point where if you go to the Federalist Society's convention, which is the leading conservative lawyers group, you hear people talk about these ideas all the time. You hear U.S. Senators, Rand Paul, Mike Lee, talking about how they want to bring us back to this era when child labor laws are unconstitutional. So I think we need to be respectful in fearing Justice Thomas because he wants to do some really dangerous things, and he's been more effective than I would have imagined anyone could be in trying to push these very dangerous ideas. Well, I mean, having read it and reread his stuff, I mean, maybe he has he has a brilliant law clerk, but I, I just disagree with his with his notion that he is this uh, mythical. Uh, yeah, that he he's this mythical great mind. He he really isn't. I mean, I, we just disagree on that, and that just comes from my reading of his stuff. But the point is, I we can't agree on the fact that he's dangerous. He's, he's da- very dangerous. He's dangerous is because we can, if you can imagine, simply taking a politician off of the street and putting a black robe on the politician, and then saying, "Now you you have this court seat for life." You can tamper with the American Constitution for life. You can mess with democracy for life. There's no way we can get rid of you. You can appear. As a matter of fact, this is what really puts you on edge about Clarence Thomas. He appears at the most right-wing, fundamental right-wing organization meetings in the world where he gives speeches about what he has done and, in fact, what he intends to do. That's unheard of, Ian. Never in the history of the court have you had a Scalia or a Thomas showing up on behalf of associated industries, giving talks to, to organizations like CPAC. You've never had that in the history of this court. Even though you had Black, who obviously was, uh, you know, he, 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 he certainly wanted to legitimize the use of the 14th Amendment. And mm-hmm. he wanted to say this 14th Amendment has applications to states. 14th Amendment is important for everybody mm-hmm. uh, is from the state up. He never went around giving speeches about it and handling politics about it. This character does. Yeah, no, I mean, there's something, like I said, very ideological about what, what, what Thomas is trying to do. There's a project that I think has developed with the legal right in this country. You saw it with the case against the Affordable Care Act. You see it with yes. this challenge um, to the birth control rules. You see it with the challenges that are going with the eff- effort now to take religious liberty and to make it into something that essentially trumped democracy in all cases. So if we have a civil rights law, someone can ignore that if they have a religious objection to the civil rights law. All of these efforts, what they point to, is an effort to make democracy irrelevant. It's an, if an, it's an effort to make it so it didn't matter that Barack Obama was elected president of the United States twice. He doesn't get to have his health care bill. It doesn't matter that this birth control protection is something that Americans widely agree with, you know, we don't get to have it because people like Justice Thomas think that they've got a better idea. 
And that strikes me as terrifying because what's unique about the Supreme Court is that they aren't politicians. They're the only branch of the government that is not elected. And if someone's going to be making law on my behalf, I think the most important thing is that we have the ability to vote them out of office hmm. if we don't yeah, like what they're doing. I, I, Ian, I agree with every. I think it's a great article. The only thing that, that you and I would differ about is I believe that Clarence Thomas is a buffoon in a black <laughs> robe. So thank you for joining me, okay? It, it's great to be here. Thanks so much. Ian Milheiser is the editor of Think Progress Justice. Coming up, we'll find out how income inequality is destroying our democracy. I'm Mike Papantonio. We'll be right back with more Ring of Fire. I'm Mike Papantonio, host of Ring of Fire on Free Speech TV. The corporate controlled media rakes in millions of dollars in profit every year by only telling you half of the story. They're at the mercy of their corporate sponsors and they refuse to take on corporations that kill, maim, and harm consumers. Here at Free Speech TV, we don't have shareholders, we don't answer to corporate America, and we don't pull any punches. Our loyalty is to the viewers, and our viewers are the ones that help keep Free Speech TV alive. Free Speech TV doesn't take corporate money, and that's why your financial support is so important to us. Viewer voices, not corporate sponsors, fuel Free Speech TV and drive many of our programming decisions. You can help protect Free Speech TV with your donation. Free Speech TV airs independent news and views for independent thinkers like you. Our people-powered programs demonstrate what's possible in our democracy when we unite as workers, as students, as artists, as parents, and partners in progress. More people means more power. Each donation brings more power in programs and more possibilities for change. Our programming equips viewers with vital tools, resources, contacts, and examples of how to collectively build alternative, sustainable solutions to serious community problems. Please donate now and bring these organizing tools into your community. Everyone should have access to news and information that's forming the world around them. Our goal is to keep you and everybody involved. We aim to reach every viewer possible because we're all in this together. Go online to freespeech.org and help support independent, honest news journalism. Your support helps keep information flowing and together we can hold the corporate media more accountable. We perpetuate a culture of crime all the way from Wall Street right down to the Main Street in our hometowns. It's worse than it has been since FDR took control of the problem and said we can't count on industry taking care of the American labor. They probably have already engaged in some type of criminal cover-up. And the law prohibits the government from even doing anything about it. Watch America's Lawyer, Mike Papantonio, every Sunday at noon Eastern on Free Speech TV. Welcome back to Ring of Fire. I'm Mike Papantonio. The growing gap between the have and the have-nots is creating some serious, serious problems in American democracy. Joining me to talk about these problems and what we should do about it is best-selling author Cliff Schechter. Cliff, over the years, you were writing about, uh, about the inequality uh, poison, the inequality poison for American democracy. I, I think you may have been one of the first people really writing about this topic, so I wanted to ask you about it. If you were to break down, just just give me the, the, the overall view of how poisonous this, this, this disparity is, 1%. Actually, we say 1%, but the statistics show that it's far less than 1% that control all the money. I think that it was one, it was, it was point, uh, I think it was 0.4% of the American public drew in about 80% of all the wealth that's moved through the system in the last five years. So staggering numbers. What, what, what are the problems that the average American needs to know about where it comes to the poison of this inequality? Well, you know, and thanks for having me on to talk about this, Pap. Um, I think, you know, the Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis said it best. He said we can either have great disparities in wealth or we can have democracy. We can't have both. 
Um, and I think that just lays it all out. The, the simple fact of the matter is, is when you get wealth concentrated at the top, like we've got, um, when you get a situation and you create it that we have with Citizens United and these other decisions where it takes so much money to run a successful election, you know, then you see everything get corrupted. I mean, we're basically now it's sort of pick a billionaire. I mean, it, you know, the, it sadly it happens, look, it happens on the left too, because the truth is if you don't have billionaires backing whatever issue it is you support, you've got very little chance. They own the political system. As you know, they've got way too much influence in the legal system. Our Supreme Court is a joke at this point. Our courts are empty. President Obama sadly hasn't done his job, frankly, in pushing for more justice, you know, some more judges on, on our various federal courts. Uh, so you got, you know, the, the federal uh, election commission's a joke. When you add all this up, what it means is that there are people in, in Washington um, who are controlled by money. They always, there's, there's always been that as a factor. Now it is um, egregious. Okay, well, let, let, me, let me back up. Let me, you've said a lot there. Let me break down some of the things that you've said and add to it. First of all, okay, so the legislative process, when you have too much money at the top, you have all of those people controlling what the legislation is of the day. If the bankers want a bailout, they control the, the legislation. If the, if the oil industry wants more subsidies, they control the legislation. If the chemical industry wants to deregulate, they control the legislation. If the coal mining company doesn't, you know, doesn't care about the environment, they control legislation. That's part of it. Okay, but you, you, you began with, by saying, really, that when we have the money at the top— they don't just control the legislation, they control the actual people they're legislating. In other words, they either have – politics is left only for the wealthy, the wealthy politician, or the lap dog, the kind of – I call them the, the monkey grinder's monkey that is at the behest of the, the wealthy. So that's the second part of it. But isn't there a lot more? Let, I mean, let's talk, about, let's talk about the messaging. I mean, the message of what our democracy, how is that controlled? Well, yeah, look, there's a ton more because there are various institutions, and you know about this because you're involved with one of them, um, that are set up to, to keep us democracy, to counteract the, the kind of influence of the wealth of those at the top. We have we have a, a legal system that's supposed to do that. However, when you've got many states that elect their, their judges, for example, others have these cronyistic appointments, you get that process corrupted. Well, we've got, we have a media that's supposed to sit here and, and follow and expose what's going on. OK, um, let me stop you right there. A media where we used to have, what was it, 55 organizations, independent organizations control right. the media. Now four control the message. And so there again. So again, the billionaires control that message, right? That's right. So, so when so when a, when a big institution is bought by a billionaire, are they going to report on what that billionaire is doing or his friends are doing? Of course, they're not. And when fewer institutions have these these sort of labyrinths, these webs of influence, where there's about 15, 20, 50 different companies under one roof, all doing different things, you know, is GE uh, going to to cover what's going on uh, with with you know the the weapons industry if they own media? The, with the media they own, because, of course, they make money off of weapons, too. Yeah. Um, and that becomes an enormous problem. Well, one, one, thing, one thing is I've seen you write about is the, the lack of prosperity that comes out of a system to where a CEO is paid multi, multi-million dollar bonuses regardless of how they do. For example, um, you know, if you take a look at Hank McKinnell, walked away from Pfizer in 2006 with $170 million in bonuses. Now, that's where he left Pfizer with so many lawsuits that the company was gagging. They lost money that year because he, he, he led them in to this lawsuit frenzy because he was a corrupt CEO. Or maybe Bob Nardelli, uh, you know, pocketed $240 million after he left Home Depot, even though the stock dropped 40%. Now, your point, if I understand your point that you've made in the past, is this, this disparity where there's no connection between prosperity and, and how that CEO is bonus, it destroys produ the, the productive American. It destroys, it, it, it destroys prosperity, doesn't it? It really does, because it gives, as we've been talking about, these guys the top a vast amount of control over our system, which is never good for democracy. But as you said also, when all that money is going to guys at the top, what are we doing then? Then we're, 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 we're saying we can't afford to raise the minimum wage. 
we can afford to pay Lee Raymond at Exxon $320 million, you know, whatever it was around that, to leave in 2005. But somehow we can't afford to raise the wages of average workers. And at some point, if workers can't actually buy things, you know, because those people at the top, they're just putting in a Swiss bank somewhere. They're, they're doing the Mitt Romney shuffle, you know. Um, if, if we don't have regular people every day, you know, Henry Ford even said that, that he needed his workers to be able to buy his products. If we lose that ability, we, 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 we've lost we've lost the ability, haven't we, yeah. uh, Cliff? If you take a look at uh, what's happening, another thing that I've seen either you write about or some other people have really followed this story is the idea of the speculative society it used to be that we built things used to be that the billionaires said, you know what, I want to invent a better airplane. I want to build a better road. I want to build a better bridge. Now what the billion, billionaires do is they play with fantasy money. The thing, listen to this number. Tell me, you, you might have written this. I have notes here in front of me. But $783 trillion, $783 trillion moved through the derivative scams, okay? Now, the derivative scams didn't build a new car. They didn't come through with any medical breakthrough. They didn't create anything. All they did was created paper. Now, to, to put that in comparison, $783 trillion moved through with derivative scams. The comparison is if you take the entire the whole annual gross domestic product uh, for the world, for the entire world, it's only $65 trillion. Now, that, that tells the story, doesn't it? I mean, the, this wealth is poisoning the democratic process, isn't it? It does, and look, it corrupts everything, Pat, because there was a system here, and we know it works because we had it in the 1950s. You know, in 60, I mean, clearly there are people, there are groups that were not included, like women and minorities. I'm not claiming that was a golden era. I'm just saying for workers and for our economy, you had a system where you had a 90% top tax rate. You had regulation, strong regulation of industry. You had strong unions. Um, you know, you had wages that kept up and, and surpassed inflation. And so what you had was people who broadly shared in this prosperity. Now, when you've got these guys making 320 million, they don't need us anymore. They're not tied to our democracy anymore. They're guys that maybe have a home in New York, a home in London, a home in Hong Kong. They don't. And, have and, it, and it's all gated, all gated community, by the way. That's right. Well, that's the other thing is they can afford to privatize the police because the police aren't protecting them anymore. Their private security is right. So all the sort of institutions that we need, you know, they can they can privatize public schools. Their kids aren't going to public schools. The institutions that we need in a democracy for broad based opportunity, prosperity, these all become things, you know, play things for these guys to privatize and make even more money off of. And of course, that corrupts everything. So, well, I mean, now, now you even have the education process being corrupted because the one percent have so many. Florida State, right in, in North Florida, uh, Tallahassee, Florida, not University of Florida, but Tallahassee, Florida, the, the, the Seminoles. They have a system where they take they take millions of dollars from the Koch brothers for their business school. Now, the problem is the Koch brothers who have all they are is edgy, crazy conservatives. They say, we want to tell you who you can hire. We want to tell you what you can teach. And if you don't let us do that, we're not going to give you the money. So the corruption is almost endless. I mean, you follow it when you can follow it to a state university. Uh, well, you bring up a great point because that was another one of those. You know, I talked about the media. I talked about the law. I talked about government, these institutions that were, that were there to regulate, rein in, expose, you know, great wealth. Academia was another one. So these guys just figured they might as well go buy that off, too. You talked about Florida, you know, but, you, but it was Florida State. I, I may be getting it wrong, but the, the Seminoles. But, you know, University of Chicago has seen right-wing money come in. Stanford University, the Hoover Institution, has had right-wing money. The Koch brothers themselves have put a whole bunch of money into George Mason University right outside of Washington, D.C., so they can influence Washington that way with these fake academics that produce things that nobody else could find if they were trying. That's how you get... The climate, you know, gl climate, uh, global warming skeptics. The That's deniers, how you get yeah. More guns lead to less crime. That's how you get people who say, you know, just deregulate the economy and there'll be growth for everyone. Supply side economics works. These aren't real academics. These are people that are bought and paid for. Let me tell you a quick story. I got about 20 seconds. The, the sugar babies story, I don't know if you've seen this developing, where college students are now, because of the, the they can't afford to go to college, they're actually having, the, it's a record numbers, uh, signing up as, for sugar daddies, where sugar daddies 
pay it's, it's it's called the new sugar baby trend as a matter of fact they looked at it at new york university uh, uh 500 that they could identify because the wealth disparity is so bad that they can't even afford to go to college so they hook up with some old billionaire you know dying probably impotent but willing to so pay an that servant essentially yes exactly I mean, it, it's an ugly story. It's an ugly story that needs to be talked about a lot more. I'm going to have you back on the show. We want to continue this conversation. Thank Thanks you, Cliff. So much, I appreciate it, Pat. Republicans have always believed that business leaders make the best politicians, but history has shown that that is just the opposite of the truth. Success in business rarely translates to political success. I have Paul Waldman, editor of the American Prospect, here with me to explain why. Paul, so the issue that we hear the Republicans talking about again and again, it's almost, it's that drone. It's the it's same thing over and over again. The businessman can save the American democratic process if you elect the businessman. What a crazy myth. Your story, I just think, really handles that myth very well. Give me your 10,000 foot on it. Well, you know, we hear this in, in almost every election. There are candidates all over the country who say, I'm not a politician, I'm a businessman. And, and what I compare it to is, you know, if you needed a new timing belt on your car and a guy came up to you and said, you know, I'm a florist and you know how corrupt mechanics are. So if you want your timing belt fixed, I'm the guy to do, to do it for you because I don't actually know anything about cars. Well, <laughs> you'd think that was kind of ridiculous, even if there are a lot of shady mechanics out there. And the thing is, politics is, uh, it, is its own endeavor and it requires its own skills. And yeah, there are a lot of politicians who are corrupt or incompetent. Um, but that doesn't mean that the fact that you actually come from an entirely different realm where you've had success means that you're going to be successful at, uh, at you know, cleaning up Washington because you were a businessman. It's, it's a totally different kind of thing. It requires different sorts of skills. Um, it has different kinds of demands. And I think the part of this is that, you know, Republicans have spent, it, you see it, you certainly see it from Democrats. There's, there's no question. There are Democrats who run with that mm. same argument. Yeah, yeah, um, blue dogs especially. Yeah, yeah um, but it, it's more from Republicans. And I think part of the reason is that they've spent so much time over the last couple of decades, really, kind of almost deifying businessmen. Um, their whole uh, their whole program seems to be to be worked around them. You know, there was an interesting story a couple of weeks ago from a, a gathering of Republicans uh, in Congress, and Eric Cantor, the, the Republican uh, Majority Leader in the House, was giving them a speech, and he told them that you know most Americans don't actually own their own businesses. <laughs> they work. That, they so work for them, businesses. Yeah. Yeah. So when you tell them we're going to cut the corporate income tax or we're going to you know reduce environmental relations, that doesn't you know necessarily make them excited because they work for other people. That's what most Americans do, and it was almost as if the people, the other Republican members in the room, just like couldn't believe it because they yeah, had Paul, spent so much let, time talking about this that that was their only perspective. Let let me ask you something. It's almost like they don't read history books. For, certainly there's this notion that the Republican Party has become anti-intellectual in a lot of ways. But if they read business, if they simply read history books, they would see that these characters that they believe are going to do so well, whether it's uh, Meg Whitman or Ross Perot, they didn't do that well. And historically, the business candidate doesn't do that well because the average American do, doesn't buy into this idea that, gee whiz, he's a successful businessman, therefore he can run the country. That average worker out there is more concerned about how is he treating the worker. Isn't that part of the problem here? That was certainly a problem with Meg Whitman. Yeah, absolutely. And you see that over and over again with these these successful businessmen and women who become candidates. They they tend to come in, drop a huge amount of money on a race, hire a lot of high pro profile consultants. And then in, in the grind of the campaign, it turns out that they're just not very good politicians. They don't necessarily have the best strategic insights. They don't they're not good at that kind of the things that are demanded of politicians, that glad handing, that, you know, being able to walk into a room and convince everybody to vote for you. Um, and as we know, you know, the, that kind of political skill that really makes for the superstars, uh, the people like your your Bill Clintons or your, or your Barack Obamas even, you know, that's pretty rare. And it doesn't necessarily express itself in the boardroom. And so every once in a while you get someone who's successful. You know, the, the kind of prototypical case is Mike, Mike Bloomberg in New York, who yeah, really did, you know, run, yeah. run the government in a different kind of way and had a lot of successes. But more often... Often what you see is people like Meg Whitman or Ross Perot um, in, in that column I mentioned, the, the sort of prototypical case from back in the 1990s, Al Checky, who yeah. if you were in California at the time where, where I was at the time, you know, everybody remembers him because he was a multimillionaire who came in yeah. and just 
spent, I don't know what it was, 40 or $50 million in the government right. campaign and got almost no votes because they don't really know what they're doing. But there's a belief that, well, you know, I was successful in one area, so I can just come into this political arena and have exactly the same success. And usually it just doesn't work out. Well, isn't the, I mean, the average, average worker out there is saying, OK, I have a boss, too. There's a lot of things about the boss that I don't like. The boss isn't paying me all that well. The boss isn't giving me health care kind of uh, protection that I need. The boss isn't really concerned with whether my children get a good education. The boss, this business candidate out there, is simply concerned about a bottom line. And most workers relate to those issues. They don't relate to the boss mentality. They don't go play golf at the country club with the boss. They're not part of that inner circle clique. And I think that's the Republicans simply don't get that time after year after year. Remember, the last thing was small businessmen. I mean, we heard all we heard about year after year, the small businessmen. What about the small businessmen? Remember that mantra? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that oftentimes there Republicans like to hold up the small businessmen when they're actually more interested in the big businessman. But, you know, you saw it with Mitt Romney, for instance. He was a guy who I think a, a lot of Republicans look at him and say, well, that's sort of the, the, the person we find most admirable, the guy who made a lot of money and turned around businesses. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know if you remember, but back in 2008, Mike Huckabee, a Republican who's maybe more in tune with what average people think, when he was running against Mitt Romney, he said that he reminds everybody of the guy who laid off your dad. And so I, I think that, that 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 was true, you know, that, as you say, most people have a different kind of perspective on on who that guy at the top. He, is. Proje he projected that because that's what he came from his entire life. And that's the, that's really the heart of your article in a lot of ways. This is a very well analyzed, Paul. And I, I really, frankly, until I saw your article, had not really thought about a the Republicans have been using this mantra forever losing with that mantra forever and that they don't get this idea that the average american doesn't believe that there are some people that are more important in the world simply because they're a businessman they're more important simply because they have money they're more effective simply because they've run a, a business the average american doesn't 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 connect with that 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 reasoning do they I don't think so. And and I think this is where Republicans have sort of, you know, they, they've bought their own rhetoric and it has kind of blinded their perspective a little bit. There's not, it's not that there's anything wrong with being successful in business. And that's no, great. But I think not. that they have set up this hierarchy where where wealth is a, a kind of a marker of virtue. And the person mm -hmm. who owns the widget factory is necessarily morally superior to the people who make the widgets down on the line. And uh, you know, maybe he is, but maybe he isn't. And if if there's a conflict between you know him wanting to not give them benefits or pay them lower wages, and them wanting to get better benef benefits and get better wages, um, the fact that that the rich guy has the position that he does doesn't make his position necessarily morally superior. And I think that this is part of the Republican problem, especially in national elections, um, is that well, are, they don't are quite we grasp that. Aren't we seeing that this go around? Aren't don't you have the Republicans out recruiting these business types to say to say to the average American, look, I'm qualified to run Washington because I'm not inside the Beltway. I know I'm smarter. I've built a I've built a cleaners industry. I've built a car dealership, so I'm smarter. Aren't we seeing that again? I mean, this 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 cycle. Yeah, they had they've recruited a number of different candidates for the Senate, about half a dozen ones. And there are there are about six or seven really key races. And in most of them, Republicans have recruited somebody who's who is a very wealthy businessman. And there are some practical reasons for that, too. It, it makes it if somebody can come in and spend his own money, then you know that he'll have money. And so from the party's perspective, that makes for an attractive candidate. Um, but it's also true that, that that they're very attracted to these guys because they're the people who I think those Republican people in the, in the Republican Party most admire. And so they think that everyone else is going to share that admiration. Well, doesn't but the average American doesn't necessarily admire that. The average American many times is a victim to that in their workplace. They may not say it. They may go home and talk to their wife and their children about it. They don't say it. It's not obvious. But if they really did the focus and they could really get that average American to tell the truth, they'd probably say, as you point out in your article, that they're more impressed with the nurse who has to work 14-hour days changing bedpans and taking care of people who are dying. Or as you, st as you state in your article, the teacher who has to spend hours and hours trying to educate our children. If they look at those two choices 
they're going to go with that person who cares. They don't have this notion of a, 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 a hierarchy where we place importance on the businessman who's made a lot of money. I, I think you really nailed that. It, talk about that a little bit more, if you would. Well, you know, as I say, that in the Republican vision, that, that businessman is sort of the person who's, who's, whose interests are most important and who has to be given the greatest consideration, but that the policy has to be shaped around making things as easy as possible for him. Um, and, you know, there are businessmen who are wonderful people, but uh, there are also a lot of other people who do all kinds of jobs that are really hard and that don't have the promise of great wealth if you're really good at them. You know, if you're a really fantastic teacher, you're not going to get rich doing it. Uh, if you're a fantastic nurse, you're not going to get rich doing it. You know, if you're and but if you're uh, a fantastic at, you know, figuring out what products somebody might want to want to buy in the in the widget arena, then you maybe you will get rich. And that's I, I, that's fine. That that's great, but it doesn't necessarily make you a better person. And you know, in every yeah. election, people always want to know that someone shares their concerns, that someone understands who they are and where they're coming from, and that once they go to to Washington or to the state capitol, that they're gonna that that's gonna be expressed in how they do their jobs. And the other thing I, the other thing I think that trips business people up is that you know they're sort of can do folks who who are <laughs> uh, who come from you know the boardroom where they give an order and then it happens. Yeah. And it's a different you know they all come and saying oh I'm gonna clean up Washington and the fact is you know no freshman member of Congress ever cleans up Washington. It's yeah. just it's it doesn't happen. And they, I think they also get very frustrated because if you're a member of Congress, you can't just give orders and make things happen. You've got to get hundreds of, of other people who have just as big egos as you do to go along with what you want to do. And that's very difficult. It requires skills that can, that may, in many cases, take decades to build up. Tom Perkins didn't do the business entities any favor by coming out with his ridiculous statement where he compared the 1% billionaire types with victims as a comparison with victims of Nazi Germany. But again, comes right down to it. Sometimes the Republicans cannot get past first base in the way they view the world. Paul Waldman, great material as usual. Uh, just uh, j this is a story I think needs to be talked about. I do this every day, and this is some really original thinking. I, I hope you'll get it out there. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. The Pap Attack. Lyndon Baines Johnson understood that his war on poverty was certainly designed as a way for Americans to responsibly move into a, a, a part of their life where they could live with a little bit of dignity. But LBJ was also responding to the advice of talented uh, economists, talented sociologists who educated LBJ on the idea that the way to build a sustainable, strong economy is to begin at the bottom and then grow upward. In other words, LBJ understood that when Americans living on the margins, where that individual is struggling to provide for food and shelter for their family, a place to live for the family, just when they're just trying to get by, if you give them something, they put it back into the economy. Now, LBJ and his advisors understood that the war on poverty was also, in effect, a war to increase prosperity in this country. But then when the crazy train hit Washington, D.C., mostly during the Reagan years, intellectually dishonest conservatives, think tanks, and, and opportunists, they came and they told the American public that they had a new invention. They told America that their new invention was going to turn old, worn-out notions of, uh, of economics on its head and that we're even going to see greater prosperity because of their new invention. That big invention, that big lie, was called trickle-down economics. Uh, small groups of billionaire inheritance babies who had never gone hungry a day in their lives uh, convinced the American media to sell the American public on the idea that if we could simply give insanely wealthy individuals, wealthy corporations, more money, that if we could give more money to that Grey Poupon billionaire crowd, that they were going to share their windfalls with America's working poor, and it's going to lessen the burden for taxpayers. That was the big pitch. Now, the truth is that the American media figured out that that was a lie, that it was a trickle-down fraud. They knew that five years into the program. Uh, honest writers have been writing about what a lie it was five years into the program. But by the time the billionaire scam was in place, you had billionaires buying up the media. So the trickle-down trash argument, it could be recycled day after day uh, in TV and radio and, and in print. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, this week we're seeing this irresponsible corporate media pitching the teabag Republican talking point that uh, that if we uh, if we don't do something to take money away from workers, that it's going to hurt the worker. That's their pitch. Listen carefully to what they're going to say. They're going to say that unemployed workers would actually benefit if we take these this 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 safety net away from them. According to the outlets like CNBC and Fox, American workers have become too lazy. They become too comfortable with the table scraps that billionaires are throwing on the floor for them. And the trickle down idea is that if we give working poor no table scraps at all, then the economy is going to spin into a new level of prosperity because those millions of what they call lazy workers who can't provide for food or clothing for their family or housing for their children, that they're going to miraculously invent some new way to generate money, and that's going to generate an increase of prosperity in our economy. That is really their argument. Listen to the argument coming from the Hill and coming from the, the, the store-bought corporate media. Uh, you, you've, got, you, you've got, if you listen to McConnell, you listen to Boehner, you listen to those types, you're, con- you're going to conclude that they believe that when a person is starving, that that person is somehow going to reach further down and find some character and some resource that allows them to live and, 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 and launch themselves out of poverty. Since the days that that feeble, old, tired, old man, Ronald Reagan, sold his trickle-down revolution, the Republican Party and all the oddballs who still call themselves Republicans have taken on the appearance of of characters that are void of of decency. They're predators willing to, to, to evaluate right and wrong uniquely in terms of a dollar. Uh, they've so completely lost their moral compass, in fact, that uh, it, th- this week the House Republican Conference had to send out a memo telling them how to act like they had him empathy. The memo instructed them how you can at least fool the American public to make them believe that you have a sense of compassion. The memo really did go out. Millions of unemployed people today are going to be told by the Republican Uh, by the Republican congressman that, gee, the reason they voted against extending benefits was because they were trying to help them. They have compassion. The truth is we have a better chance of gasoline dropping to a dollar a gallon than we do having a 2014 Republican even spelling empathy correctly or even spelling compassion correctly, uh, much less understanding it. You know, I'd advise the House Republican Conference fool who sent out that ridiculous memo that they can't reinvent reality. The very reason that the people they're communicating with are Republicans in 2014 is because they have zero kinship with the average American worker. They don't understand what it's like when a person can't feed their children or have a place to live or clothe their children. For years, the Republican advisors like Frank Luntz have been trying to coach people to, 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 te- to, to tell them how to act. People like Mitch McConnell and Marco Rubio coach them into at least giving the appearance of being a well-adjusted human being in the same way that the stripes will always distinguish the difference between a damn zebra and an extraordinary looking stallion the gop in front of a a a, a politician's name is always going to separate that politician from the overwhelming majority of Americans who genuinely believe that empathy plays a part in the way we treat our fellow man, that compassion really does matter in the way that we treat our neighbor that can't afford food for his family. People like McConnell and people like Boehner, I have to tell you, if you're listening, you're always going to be a damn zebra. You'll never be a stallion. That's it for this week's Ring of Fire, but you can keep up with us throughout the week online at ringoffireradio.com or on Twitter at Ring of Fire Radio and on Facebook. I'm Mike Papantonio. We'll see you next week right here on Ring of Fire.
Hi, I'm Mike Papantonio, host of Ring of Fire on Free Speech TV. The corporate controlled media rakes in millions of dollars in profit every year by only telling you half of the story. They're at the mercy of their corporate sponsors and they refuse to take on corporations that kill, maim, and harm consumers. Here at Free Speech TV, we don't have shareholders, we don't answer to corporate America, and we don't pull any punches. Our loyalty is to the viewers, and our viewers are the ones that help keep Free Speech TV alive. Free Speech TV doesn't take corporate money, and that's why your financial support is so important to us. Viewer voices, not corporate sponsors, fuel Free Speech TV and drive many of our programming decisions. You can help protect Free Speech TV with your donation. Free Speech TV airs independent news and views for independent thinkers like you. Our people-powered programs demonstrate what's possible in our democracy when we unite as workers, as students, as artists, as parents, and partners in progress. More people means more power. Each donation brings more power and programs and more possibilities for change. Our programming equips viewers with vital tools, resources, contacts, and examples of how to collectively build alternative, sustainable solutions to serious community problems. Please donate now and bring these organizing tools into your community. Everyone should have access to news and information that's forming the world around them. Our goal is to keep you and everybody involved. We aim to reach every viewer possible because we're all in this together. Go online to freespeech.org and help support independent, honest news journalism. Your support helps keep information flowing and together we can hold the corporate media more accountable.